Continuing debate, reprise de debat, the honorable member for Kitchener Center. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to rise to speak uh, on behalf of folks from Kitchener Center with respect to Bill C-56, uh, the signature uh, measure of which involves removing GSD from rental home construction. And so I'll start by saying very clearly, I certainly support this bill, as my colleague from Saanich Gulf Islands does. It's an important and good measure. However, it is not nearly the kind of ambition we need to meet the moment we are in. And that is a very deep and protracted housing crisis. Uh, specifically, in my community, in the last three years alone, the number of people living unsheltered has more than tripled to over 1,000 people. Home prices in our community, if you compare back to 2005, in 2005, the average house price was around three times the average person's income. Today, it's over eight times. House prices have gone up 275%, wages up 42%. Pretty clear that wages aren't keeping up. We're also losing 15 units of affordable housing to renovations and the financialization of our housing for every one new affordable unit getting built. What that looks like day to day is that the shelter system in, in my community is overflowing. One example, you know, the week before we, we returned here, I showed up for a community meeting at um, an apartment building downtown Kitchener. More than 40 people showed up on that night, invited by their counselor. Uh, I was there as, as well as bylaw enforcement, and we heard from folks there about the living conditions in their, in their building, everything from cockroaches to bed bugs. And what the residents of that building were clear in telling us is that they knew they didn't have any other options that there was no recourse, there's insufficient recourses. Of course, the, we can talk about the landlord-tenant board and the backlog there, but the fact is that because we haven't been building the kind of social housing we need in this country, people are left with no other options. Or I can tell you about, you know, as I've heard from other colleagues here, when I was knocking on doors this past summer and a, a young man I spoke with, he was in, uh, engaged. Uh, he's working in the trades, living at his parents. His fiance is a teacher. She's doing the same. And they don't know when they'll ever be able to afford uh, a place of their own. To help restore affordability, CMHC is telling us we need to build 3.5 million more units than planned by 2030. And if we're going to do that, we need to be looking at two sides of this. The first is significant transformational investments in housing. And, you know, this has been done in this country before. Back in the 1970s, federal assistance for building starts across the country where 40% of all federal, of all building starts had federal assistance. That went down to 8% by the 1980s. And today, no surprise, if you look at the total stock of social housing across the country, we're way at the back of the G7, we're at 3.5%. So even a call as bold as saying, let's double the social housing stock, that only gets us to 7%, which is only kind of the middle of the peer average amongst the G7. To do that though, we need to get serious about having CMHC get back into building housing the way that they used to, Many colleagues have been talking about an acquisition fund that nonprofits across the country have been calling for, a fund that would allow nonprofits across the country to preserve what are currently affordable units, to avoid losing them to the financialization of housing, and in so doing, ensure that those might remain affordable over the long term. In my community, for example, I spoke with a leader from a local nonprofit um, uh, uh, organization. She was able to share with me and sent me afterwards 12 different properties that they've already identified that should an acquisition fund, like the one being called for by ACORN and many others, that they would be so keen to jump in and preserve those units. An organization that's operated in my community for decades, 
focused on ensuring uh, that we preserve affordable housing, they are ready to go. But they're going to need the federal government to step in and ensure that the funds are there to help them to preserve those uh, units. Or we can talk about investments. You know, the Rapid Housing Initiative, for example, it's a fantastic program. It's not that the government isn't doing anything, but the issue is that it was in Budget 2022 and we haven't heard anything since about the next round of rapid housing. What we need to be seeing is sustained, permanent, ongoing funds that organizations across the country can count on. Same when it comes to, to co-op housing. I was one of the first to cheer when we saw 1.5 billion new dollars invested in co-op housing in budget 2022. Now, unfortunately, none of those uh, dollars have actually rolled out yet to build co-op housing with that money. Uh, we need to see that money getting spent, but we also need to see ongoing year-over-year -year investments so that we get back to where we used to be before the early, early 90s when we saw federal and provincial governments pull out of uh, the really critical role that they have to play in building affordable housing. This crisis didn't happen overnight. It's decades in the making. I appreciate the Minister of Housing for how clearly he has articulated that. He said very clearly multiple times, multiple parties at the federal level have led towards this housing crisis. Well, if that's his admission, we're going to need to see investments today reflect the reality of the crisis we are in. The second piece we need to get at is we need to be honest that homes should be places for people to live. They shouldn't be commodities for investors to trade. But the reality is that's what's different between folks who are looking to, to rent and buy homes today versus my parents in the 1980s. When they were looking to buy a home, they were competing with other people. Today, people in my community are competing with massive corporations. And that's been incentivized. As you may know, Mr. Speaker, I've spoken many times in this place around one example. I see it as a bit of a litmus test. If we were honest about addressing the financialization of housing, we wouldn't have tax exemptions for one of the largest corporate landlords in the country. But that's exactly what we have. Real estate investment trusts who have almost exclusively been buying existing uh, uh, units. The reason being, of course, it's, it's more profitable for them to do so. And one of the CEOs of these real estate in, investment trusts was actually in the news this past summer for saying exactly that, that they primarily buy existing to get the best return possible. Well, why is it that they are tax exempt? What is the social value of that exemption? And if this government was serious about addressing the financialization of housing, why not take what the PBO has now told us, 300 million over the next five years. It's not going to solve the, the housing cri a crisis, but pretty clear that if we're going to address financialization, we'd start by removing the incentives that corporate landlords are currently benefiting from to only accelerate their financialization of housing. We'd obviously move into things like ending the blind bidding process, increases to vacancy taxes, Right now, it's a 1% it's a vacancy tax that likely isn't going to really influence the behavior of a, of a large corporate investor in the housing market. If we were to increase that, that, that might change, as well as moving towards more meaningful protections for tenants. Um, in closing, I'll share, of course, if we're going to build this volume of housing, we need to also be doing it with the climate in mind. And we'll continue to advocate to the federal government when they're looking at, uh, as I know they are when it comes to the new building code in 2025, to be ensuring we accelerate that building code to ensure that provinces and territories can follow the federal government's lead to bring more resiliency into that code to ensure we're building the kind of housing that is resilient to the climate crisis that we're already in, in the midst of. And so, as I shared earlier, certainly happy to support Bill C-256. Glad to see this measure being moved ahead. And I'm looking forward to seeing the federal government step up far more quickly when it comes to addressing the housing crisis that we're in. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, Kessinger Kamantara, the honourable member for uh, Hamilton Centre.
And actually, no, I can't because she's not sitting in the right, uh, the right spot. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I know the member has emphasized a great deal of his comments in regards to housing. Um, and as a government, uh, for the first time in, in generations, virtually since 1993, uh, when we had the constitutional changes of Charlottetown Accord, where all political parties, with the exception of the Greens, um, uh, wanted to ultimately see the provinces play a role and marginalize Ottawa. But since then, as a government, this government, whether back in 2016 when we first came into office, have invested literally hundreds of millions flowing into billions of dollars, including housing, uh, housing strategy, including uh, supporting nonprofits like um, like Habitat for Humanity, uh, including uh, exporting. Uh, um, uh, housing co-ops and expansions and, and local provincial governments that want to cooperate in investing in nonprofit housing. My question to the member is actually fairly straightforward, and that is, uh, would, he, would he not acknowledge that Ottawa, yes, plays a very important role, but it's, it's going to take a lot more than Ottawa alone to resolve the problem. We need municipalities, nonprofit groups, the many different stakeholders, the provinces, all to uh, get on board so we can tackle this uh, issue in Canada today. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. I will agree with the member for Winnipeg North on this point any day of the week. We need all levels of government to step up. But we also need to be honest that the investment he mentioned for co-op housing, one that I, I, I mentioned in my speech I'm really uh, uh, glad for, the fact is there was zero dollars for co-op housing in budget 2023. In fact, it wasn't just co-op housing. There was zero new dollars for, for housing at all in budget 2023, if not for one line uh, uh, item on Indigenous housing that's not going to be uh, starting for a few years still. So no level of government can take a year off from funding housing. If the region of uh, Waterloo did the same, they would have people lining up outside the doors. The federal government can't either. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable colleague for his speech. A member of the government just said that the government reinvested in housing, but prefers the concept of affordable housing over social housing, which would include cooperatives. Affordable housing to us is a vague concept. Often the amounts that go towards it don't actually build affordable housing. What does my honourable colleague think? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Kitchener Centre. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question to my colleague, my honourable colleague, for Joliet. It's such an important question because the definition of affordable housing is different in different programs under this government. And a definition of affordable that talks about 80% of market isn't really affordable. So we need to push this government to give a definition of affordable housing that is really affordable. Very little time left before we have to move on to the next item. And I know the honorable member for, uh, for, uh, for uh, Hamilton Centre uh, tried in the wrong seat, so now he's in the right seat. The honorable member for Hamilton Centre, when a quick question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we heard the honorable member speak about the housing crisis. I actually would like to suggest that what we have is a crisis of capitalism. We have the capitalization of people's very existence identified in the real estate investment trust that he's highlighted. Uh, we have Vanguard, Black BlackRock and others. In my community, sir, we have nine apartment buildings that are facing rent evictions and dem evictions. So my question through you, Mr. Honorable Speaker, to the people who are going to be meeting in Hamilton in about an hour from those nine uh, apartment buildings, what do you have to say about the crisis of capitalism and the impacts that it has on housing? I have nothing to say uh, as the chair occupant, but the Honorable Member of Kitchener Centre win 10, 15 seconds. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that housing is a human right and it deserves to be more than a preamble in a bill. It needs to be enshrined in legislation. Here, here. Here, here. Uh, it being 546, the House will now proceed to the consideration of private members' business as listed on today's order paper. Private members' business resuming consideration at section.